Hello and welcome to week two. Um, with you this week, we're going to be looking at anxiety disorders. Um, this week, your assignments are uh, chapters five and ten in Toussaint and Fitzpatrick, chapters eight, nine, and ten in Boland, and then also in your DSM five, you should be looking at uh, anxiety disorders and PTSD. There'll be a case study. Um, pay close attention on the discussion board. Pay close attention to what group you're in and for your initial post and then your responses. Please follow that very carefully. We're also going to be, there's a, a brief review of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology this week. So there are multiple types of anxiety. There's separation anxiety, social anxiety, uh, specific phobias, Agoraphobia, agoraphobia, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, hoarding disorder, PTSD, uh, which is kind of in its own category now, and then trichotillomania uh, and, and skin picking. Also considered a type of uh, 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 social, I mean, um, uh, anxiety disorder and self-injurious behavior. Let's look at the anxiety cascade. Uh, the first thing you have is a stimulus. The stimulus triggers release of norepinephrine in the locus ceruleus of the brainstem. And then norepinephrine is released uh, systemically. And this is what causes the psychological symptoms or physiological symptoms of anxiety. I apologize. It's the physiologic symptoms of anxiety. And then further interruption of the threat occurs in the amygdala and is compared to experience with previous threats. So your brain is like, oh, this has happened before. What's going on? Um, so it compares it to previous experiences. Uh, then neural projections cause activation of the HPA, hypopituitary uh, adrenal and access and release of cortisol, stress hormone. Further transmission to the hippocampus helps to access even further memories, impacting a further response. And this is why people who have their first initial anxiety attack or panic attack, I, I'm sorry, well, it, it becomes much easier then for them in certain situations or certain things to have another one. Um, because of those memories are associated with that. Balance and impact. So there's a 28.8% lifetime prevalence for all anxiety disorders. Medium age of onset is 11. It affects one in five youth. Treatment rates only about 30 to 40% for both children and adults. And up to 70 to 80% more common in women with the exception of social anxiety disorder, which shows no difference between genders. And though I don't have any proof, I feel like since COVID that that may have equalized a little more with even with um, some of the other anxiety disorders, maybe not equalized, but lessened, because I do feel like I'm seeing a lot more men even with generalized anxiety disorder uh, since COVID. Um, up to 25% to of persons presenting um, with uh, chest pain and a shortness of breath in the ED are actually experience a panic attack. And it's, it's, tragically, sadly, it's associated with up to 70% of suicide attempts just because they're feeling so terrible, they're experiencing so much, uh, and they're tired of feeling that way. Be mindful, and we haven't gotten into a lot of this yet. You will have some more coursework, not so much in this course, but later on, on medical comorbidities. Very important. Even though you're treating the mind uh, and you're a, a PMHNP, you need to be very, very mindful of medical comorbidities and not miss an important diagnosis, uh, a medical diagnosis, and think it could be... Um, you know, mental health concern. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes anxiety can be associated with chronic, chronic inflammation, atherosclerosis, hypercoagulable states, uh, CV events after cabbage, 
depression and anxiety are risk factors for higher mortality in persons on anticoagulant therapy. And there are multiple theories as to why comorbidities are higher. Perhaps the increased cortisol increases risk of infection, affects glucose metabolism, and numerous uh, other medical sequelae. So there are a lot of anxiety disorders, as I shared earlier. We're going to talk about some of the following. Generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and trauma, though not you know, directly related maybe with, uh, with uh, anxiety disorders, but important for us to talk about. So let's look at generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, lifetime prevalence is 5.7% up to 11% percent in the geriatric population, twice as common in women than men, frequently co-occurring with mood disorders, causes distress, major impact in life functioning. Now, important that you're all aware of the criteria from the DSM-5, excessive worry, uh, anxiety greater than six months, difficult to control worry, and you have to have three or more of the following, restless or on edge, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or focusing, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbance. The DSM-5 criteria uh, experienced of, for a panic disorder um, is experience of uh, recurrent panic attacks with one or more attacks followed by at least one month of fear of another panic attack or significant maladaptive behavior related to the attack. So four or more of the following also have to be present, palpitations, sweating, trembling, shaking, shortness of breath, feeling uh, as, choke, as if you're choking, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, chills, hot flashes, numbness, tingling, derealization, depersonalization, feelings of losing control, fear of dying, and persistent concern about having another attack and avoidance of situations that may trigger panic. What else could this look like? I want you to think about that. Are there any medical things that this could look like as well? Or any other conditions? So keep, keep that in mind. So panic disorder, this is a real life scenario. This was a patient I saw uh, actually this week. For those of you who are listening in the future, this February 23. Um, I saw him just last week, uh, James, not his real name, 28-year-old single male, significant trauma in the past. Uh, for the last uh, two years, he's been experiencing generalized anxiety, uh, recently started having a panic attacks, and has been to the ED three times in the last two weeks alone with reports of, my heart is racing, I feel like I'm going to die, my arms go numb, I can't breathe, um, reported dizziness, confusion, feeling, like I said, feelings like he was going to die, uh, the more frequently he began having these episodes, uh, the more frequent, the more he began fearing they would happen. And his most recent episode was the day he was actually in my office. He had a full blown panic attack right there with me in his office. We were able to work through it. Um, I was very supportive, uh, but he had a really hard time. Um, so how did I treat him? Well, we started him on Desvanlafaxine Prestique, 50 milligrams daily, Buspirone, Boost Bar, 7.5 milligrams. <clears throat> and I did give him some Ativan, uh, Lorazepam, 0.5 milligrams uh, as needed twice a day. I only gave him 14 and I let him know right up front that that would be it. And then he was to follow up with me. We got him into therapy um, to help with his triggers and, and help manage this. Um, it was very distressing for him and it was, it was difficult to watch him go through it in my office. Uh, but I was able to help him work through this and, um, help him to be successful in recognizing what was going on because the ER, you know, they, they're there to just kind of treat and, uh, send them out. So he wasn't getting much relief from the, his ER visits and he had been worked up for a bunch of things in the ER, um, so I knew when he came to me, because I had his records, uh, what was going on. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So studies indicate that the orbitofrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the striatal regions are hyperreactive. 
Uh, this distinguishes OCD from other anxiety disorders. So there's an obsession, anxiety, or fear, fear, uh, ritualistic behavior to provide temporary relief. Again, one of my patients, uh, we'll say his name is John, 34-year-old male with Asperger's, but highly functioning, was working, um, very active. Uh, he became, though, for some reason, obsessed with his GU track and thinking that there was something wrong and constantly checking and making sure he could pee and urinate and, you know, going to the ED multiple times, going to a urology. Um, and this became a real, real problem for him. Um, so how did we treat him? Uh, I uh, started him on therapy right away um, to treat his ineffective thought patterns. Um, we started an SSRI and Buspirone, started with Prozac, and then uh, increased that, and Boost Bar, 60 milligrams uh, in divided doses. So he was taking 30 milligrams twice a day, and that seems to have helped him some. He's still struggling, but we're still continuing him in therapy and trying to help him and manage his symptoms and be proactive. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, characterized by two clinical features, uh, clinical definition of trauma or exposure to a tra traumatic event, uh, resulting response that symptoms are having a consistently negative response to one's life. Uh, the symptoms have to have occurred or last have occurred greater than one month. <clears throat> and excuse me, the symptoms include recurrent or intrusive distressing memories, disturbing dreams of the event, disassociation of the event, flashbacks, avoidance of places, situations, things, mood changes, hyperarousal, hypervigilance. Um, and again, not to be due to a medical condition or a substance use. And then let's look at some things that could look like anxiety. Certain medications, you have psychotropic meds, uh, stimulants, decongestants, antihistamines, um, bronchodilators, steroids, caffeine, big, big culprit can look like anxiety. Illicit substances, alcohol and benzo withdrawal, cocaine, amphetamines, ecstasy, cannabis, uh, spice, LSD, crack, you name it, um, they can all contribute to that. Illnesses such as uh, hyperthyroidism, an MI, heart attack, hypoglycemia, asthma, COPD, uh, phenochromocytoma. So assessing for anxiety and determining the diagnosis, um, real important to get a good history. So your chief complaint to your HPI, I think old cards, what does it look like? When did it start? What are the triggers, the hinders? Uh, what helps? Uh, what's their sleep like? Always want to assess for sleep. What's their appetite like? Um, past medical treatment, thyroid, maybe they had a traumatic brain injury, concussion, uh, substance abuse history, including caffeine. Very, very important. I'll tell you, I recently had a, a patient who uh, was struggling with anxiety, and as I was doing her intake and asking her what she eats, well, you know, after her morning coffee, she's drinking morning cups of coffee. She's drinking monster drinks uh, throughout the day and did not think that that was contributing to her anxiety. We had a long discussion about that, and she was going to work on weaning off of that. Uh, family history, past psych history, social history, and of course, vital signs. Is their blood pressure elevated? Is their blood pressure too low? Um, looking at, again, their heart rate. Is it elevated? Is it low? Something to consider. And then on your mental status exam, of their appearance, are they thin, cachectic at times, disheveled? Their behavior when they're with you, are they restless, fidgety, tense, tremulous, hyper alert, compulsive? their mood? Are they sad, depressed, angry, agitated, irritable, anxious? <clears throat> Affect, is it tense? Is their speech rapid, pressured, stuttering? And their thought process, you can see all of that here. So just be mindful of, this is like a, a someone who would be a typical mental status exam on, on with someone with, with anxiety. 
psychotherapy, again, I can't under or overemphasize the importance of psychotherapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is extremely beneficial and effective, including exposure therapy. Uh, remember thoughts equal behavior equals a response. Uh, interpersonal therapy can be very effective, and uh, such as assertiveness training. Some people are, are so anxious they're afraid to speak up. Um, they get anxious thinking about that, or their anxiety is caused because they're they feel they're being treated poorly, or and maybe they are, and they're afraid to speak up. So assertiveness training can be helpful. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing (EMDR), and that uses eye movements and rhythmic movements to cause uh, cognitive restructuring of trauma responsive, extremely effective in PTSD and anxiety. Um, I do want to eventually get a certification in EMDR because I feel like it is so, so helpful. Neuromodulation, um, studies have been promising using transmagnetic uh, simulation in the treatment for refractive re uh, OCD. So let's talk about some medications for anxiety disorder. You have your benzos. Again, I'm going to caution you. Be very careful with these. Um, Short-term bridge. Short-term therapy as a bridge to medication. Um, you don't feel like you have to ever give them. Um, so the general mode of action, binding to GABA, which increases inhibitory effects. Alpha receptors cause the sedative and anticonvulsant effect. Beta receptors cause the muscle relaxation. And Xanax or Alprazolam has some antidepressant uh, anti effect as well. However, I personally hate Xanax. <laughs> I try never to prescribe it uh, just because I find that it has been one of the most abused substances. Um, but, you know, you, you can practice how you want. That's just my, my thoughts and take on that. Um, use caution when prescribing to the elderly. Uh, again, it can cause... Uh, you know, falls, respiratory depression. We know that benzodiazepine use long term has been linked to increased an early dementia, increased risk of early dementia. So, and as I said, start with a plan to stop. If I do put my patient on a benzo, I always say I'm giving you a short term dose for two weeks, or you can stretch it out longer, um, and that will probably be it. And then know your onset peak and duration of those those medications. Other effective uh, medications are your antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, um, mirtazapine, TCAs, um, buspirone, as I said, as effective as a benzo. I use buspirone all the time. Uh, Anticonvulsants, gabapentin, lamotrigine, uh, mixed results. Pregabulin, Lyrica has been a little promising. Second generation antipsychotics are off label, although Seroquel does, I think, have some indication for anxiety, generalized anxiety treatment. Uh, but again, there are side effects too. Um, there's noradrenergic agents such as beta blockers, propranolol, atenolol. I've used propranolol for patients, um, especially if they get really nervous and, and their heart rate goes up, it can be very effective. There's alpha blockers such as prezosin. Um, that can help with nightmares. Let's talk a little bit about trauma. So what is trauma? Well, you have your big T traumas, traumas uh, like combat, someone who's in a, a war, sexual assault or abuse, physical assault or abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, witnessing abuse or violence, a natural disaster, uh, etc. And then you have your little T traumas, you know, maybe a minor car accident, fender bender, nobody's hurt. Um, a fight with a significant other can be uh, very upsetting. Getting fired from a job um, can be uh, cause some trauma. And having experienced trauma does not guarantee someone will develop PTSD. Just be mindful of that. So some of my patients, I just want to give you some backstories. We're going to talk about Edgar. He's uh, Hispanic, was raised in a very strict religious home. And as a child, though, he was sexually molested for years. Um, mother was also physically abusive. Uh, father was an alcoholic. Uh, when he was older, he came out as, as gay to his family and they disowned him, uh, leaving him virtually alone because no one would 
have anything to do with him. Uh, I have Tamika, she is 15, started dating an older man who was selling drugs, and she didn't know that at the time. And then he made, he made her start to sell for him, and she was put into very dangerous situations, was beaten and raped. Um, her brother, who was one year younger than she was, and they were very close, was murdered in front of her home. And uh, she had to witness that every time she walked by her, her house, and she ended up having to move, um, or her family did, because it was so traumatic. Um, <clears throat> and then as a child, Stephen experienced physical, uh, sexual, and verbal abuse, um, shared that his mother would beat him so hard uh, she broke bones. Uh, mother would frequently abuse drugs and um, be uh, intoxicated or passed out. He was moved in and out of foster care, later developed a substance use disorder, and was in and out of prison himself. Uh, he's now in treatment uh, and therapy uh, for substance use disorder and healing from his past. Um, and making great improvements. And then Angela was uh, severely beaten multiple times by her ex, and he also ran her over with his car. She sustained multiple fractures and was also mentally uh, abused, and he was mentally abusive and would not allow her to leave the home. He did go to prison finally, and she was able to start healing. And so it's all about the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, right? Uh, the higher one's ACE score, the greater effect of trauma of one's life. So greater than six equals a lifespan shortened by 20 years. So having an ACE, though, does not guarantee a poor outcome. And you'll learn more about ACEs, I think, in your pediatric course. But I just wanted to touch on these here because they are so important and you're going to see so much of it. So a higher ACE score is associated with a traumatic brain injury, fractured burns, depression, definitely anxiety, suicide, um, unplanned pregnancies, pregnancy complications, fetal death, HIV, STDs, unsafe sex, cancer, diabetes, substance abuse, negative outcomes in education, job status, and overall income. So specific ACE questions to ask, there's a history of emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual, sexual abuse, uh, emotional neglect, physical neglect. So we often forget about neglect, but that's important to assess for. Separation or divorce, witness uh, domestic violence among their parents. Um, parents abused substances and they have to witness that as a child. Parents had a mental illness. A household member who's imprisoned, um, that can be very traumatic and cause uh, increase in ACEs. So how do we treat trauma? Well, as with most mental health disorders, a comprehensive team effort is crucial. That's why I said, if you don't have a therapist, friend, make one, um, someone you can refer to, someone you're comfortable with. Um, assure they have primary care access. Clients with severe trauma have higher rates of co-occurring physical illness such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, pain. Um, so there's treating trauma does not equal treating PTSD, all right? So I don't want you to get those two confused. So be a trauma-informed care provider. Don't be a voyeur, meaning, you know, yes, we have to get a good history. Yes, we have to talk about some things, but don't try to inquire too much and get too far into someone's um Past when it's not needed or therapeutic. Um, it's not as much about what happened as it, as it is about their response. And we all carry our own degree of trauma. Um, so be careful of uh, counter transference uh, when you're working with, with patients. And I want to talk a little bit about vicarious trauma. What is it? Well, this is trauma we feel as caregivers. We all experience vicarious trauma when we continuously hear our patient's story of trauma. And vicarious trauma can lead to burnout. So it's important to maintain healthy boundaries and have, <clears throat> have an out, outlet for um, that can be beneficial for your own mental health, whether that's you know exercising, spending time with friends, family, uh, doing things that you enjoy uh, to decrease that risk of burnout and vicarious trauma. Then you, there was a video put in the, into the, 
the course uh, behind closed doors, I want you to think about that video again and think about how we can either support a person with trauma or re-traumatize them. So be mindful of that. And that's the end for this week. There's a quiz this week over weeks one and two. And next week, we'll be looking at mood disorders, such as major depression, bipolar disorder, suicide. Here's your readings for next week. Um, and there's also a training on uh, suicide screening for the, using the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Thank you. Wish you all guys uh, and girls a great week.